Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. And if you have not already done so, please silence your cell phones. If you are interested in genealogy, but have not yet begun researching your family history, mark your calendars for Saturday, February 4th. That morning, State Archive staff will discuss first steps, provide sample questions for family members, and give an overview of MDAH resources that can help you successfully complete your project. This beginning genealogy workshop is free, but you'll need to reserve a spot either through the website or by calling or emailing the department. And then you can learn more about the March 2nd and 3rd annual meeting of the Mississippi Historical Society in brochures strategically placed by the coffee and the cookies. Session titles are Jackson State University and the HBCU History and Culture, Women in Mississippi History, Environmental History in Mississippi, and 20th Century Mississippi History. Finally, I hope you'll come back next Wednesday for History's Lunch when author Ann Martin will present Delta Hot Tamales, History and Stories. Today, we're delighted to welcome Emily Irwin Jones to talk about the Mississippi Delta Chinese, a topic she wrote about in the book Ethnic Heritage in Mississippi, published by University Press of Mississippi. Emily Irwin Jones is university archivist and professor in library sciences at Library Services at Delta State University. She earned her BA in History and MA in Public History from the University of West Georgia. At Delta State, Jones has developed exhibitions, traveling exhibits, and three permanent museums. She was awarded the 2007 Delta State University Foundation Faculty Prize for Excellence in Service and named an Educator of the Year in 2006 by the Mississippi Humanities Council. Help me welcome our friend, Emily Irwin Jones. <laughs> is very sweet. Y'all are kind of come out today. Um, thank you very much, Chris, for the introductions. Um, and yes, I am Emily Jones. My dad and my grandparents really love it when I throw the Irwin in there just so that we've got genealogy on, on record. Um, but um, I have been released from Delta State to come down here and share some stories about the Chinese in Mississippi. And I really want to make sure that I thank the folks. Um, I might be the one standing up here, but there has been a multitude of people and time and investment spent to get me to be able to do what I'm doing now and sharing this story with you. I'm eternally grateful for the job that I have. Thank you, Delta State. Um, but also a boss that allows me um, the opportunity to really dig into certain areas of the mission that I am entrusted to carry out. At the University Archive, I uh, oversee the history of Delta State University, but I also oversee the history of the 18 Mississippi Delta counties that make up the Delta. Um, and in that, you, I could spend time doing pretty much anything, right? <laughs> um, but what has happened is the Chinese collections, the Chinese stories have really developed in the archive. The stories are coming out of the community. And so they're the next group of people that I'm eternally grateful for. I grew up in the Delta in Greenville. I grew up in um, uh, the First Baptist Church and never considered that Chinese neighbors or Chinese grocery stores or Chinese businessmen or children that went to school with me who were Chinese, that they were different or that having Chinese in your community in Mississippi was different. I'll share a little known secret with you if you promise not to tell. <laughs> I'm 46. <laughs> Um, and so for the majority of my life, well, my young childhood through college, when I finally woke up and realized the history that was around me, I thought every place in the world was like the Delta. Um, the other group of people that I want to make sure that I recognize before I get too far into my stories um, would be the Humanities Council. The Mississippi Humanities Council 
20-something years ago, saw uh, merit in collecting oral histories from the Chinese in the Delta. They awarded an oral history grant, and from those 20 oral histories that were collected, so much has grown. Um, has anybody in here ever submitted or applied for and won a Humanities Council grant? Okay, so those of you who don't know, one of the last questions when you submit your final grant report is, do you think your grant project will have basically legs? Will it be able to move forward? I think we've moved forward with those oral histories, so I am thankful for them and the Center for Oral History and Culture down at USM. USM, is, uh, the center, is now taking portions of our uh, collected oral histories and making them available online. I highly recommend checking out uh, more stories than what I have time to tell you today um, by going to their website. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, the Chinese men and women, the families that have spent time with me, that have invested um, their resources, their, their lineage, their heritage with me um, to teach me about what it means to be Chinese in the Mississippi Delta. Um, I have a wonderful board of um, directors that helps form how we move the Chinese Museum forward. Um, and so instead of me just wandering around in a three-story building thinking, what else can I do next? Um, I have some leadership and some guidance, and that is wonderful. Um, but it's also from them that we get the information that I'm sharing with you today. Like I said, we started out with oral histories. Um, and those spoken words, those memories, what we've done is, as a historian would do, is you take what someone remembers of a history, of their, their history or what they hear or their parents and grandparents tell, they retell it, and then a historian will look at it and try to find where the verifiable history pinpoints are so that you can make sure that human memory that sometimes is fallible, we kind of maybe forget exactly how old we were or where we were when we did something, um, we need to make sure that we remember accurately. Um, and that just gives even more weight to what we hold in the archives as far as the oral histories. So for the past 20 years, I have been doing this for 20 years. I can't believe I just, I just realized that. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years. So it's been a gradual growth, what we know of the, of the Chinese in the Delta. Um, first of all, you take a kid who thought that Chinese were everywhere and were a part of every culture um, across the country, and then I start listening to people telling me stories, and then I take what I know, what I've been taught, how to double check fact and things, and you whizzle that around in a blender, and we figure out some pretty cool history. Um, Y'all remember the Civil War? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, the Civil War, it was a time. Um, shortly after the Civil War, we will call that Reconstruction, the South was going through some growing pains. Um, and for planners in the Delta, that meant they were looking for labor sources. And by 1868, 1869, some Delta planners had communicated and gotten together and decided that they were all going to meet up at a specific place up in Memphis. And uh, they were going to talk about how to address the labor force, labor issue that they had. And at this meeting, it was a public meeting, anyone could attend, um, the planners got together and they decided that perhaps they needed to recruit a labor force. And so they contacted a company that recruits labor. That we're talking about 1868. Are we good here with date? Okay. Um, I do this a lot with shorter people that have a shorter time sp uh, attention span, so sorry. Um, so 1868, this group of men have decided that they're going to employ a recruiting agency to sail around the world to the other side of China to this little province that's almost 
geographically relevant to the Mississippi Delta. They think this is a good way to start looking for labor. If I had to start looking for labor, it would work, I think. Um, and then while they're there, they're in the region of Canton, China, the Guangdong province. Anybody know where that is? That's okay, we're all on the same le level. Great, you'll Google that in a minute if you get tired of listening to me. Um, but um, the uh, recruiting agency went around and said, so guys, who would like to go to America, work on some farmland, earn some money, and you know, in translating from one language to another, some things might have been misunderstood, but the, the basics of it were, and this is what I've been told, was that great granddaddy was told that if he came to America, it was gonna be Gold Mountain, and he would dig in the ground and find the gold. Now, here's what happened. So these guys, about 400, get on two ships. They take this long journey from Guangdong province to New Orleans. Who likes New Orleans? I do too, great, you're paying attention. Um, so in New Orleans, they get off of these two boats and then they get on two smaller boats if I were on a trip like this and we were getting off a really nice boat onto a shorter boat, I'd be a little worried at this point. But they get on these boats and they, they're following the rules and uh, they're told to get on these two, these uh, four other river boats and the river boats are going to just drop them off in places where they can work to dig this gold out of the ground, right? So they do. About eight Chinese men are dropped off in Washington County and another 11 in Bolivar County. We know this from census records. I love a census record. It's like, it's the holy grail. No one's going to debate with a, a census record, right? You know, it says they were there, they're there. So they're there. Um, even though I do like to ask why a whole lot, um, I'm trusting that census record. So, these men are deposited by 1870. Get me? 1870. By 1870, from 1870 to 1970, we will have experienced the full story arc of the majority of Chinese in the Mississippi Delta. Can you imagine? The first men who set foot in the Delta in 1870 were sojourners. They intended to come and work. They were different from anything else that had ever been in that area. They weren't owned. They didn't own. They had money. They had wherewithal to do something with themselves. They weren't conscripted. They could go if they wanted but they stayed. And into a community, into a world where you have this elite planter white class of people and a um, freed African-American culture, you introduce this little sliver of different. Very different. They looked different, they sounded different, and they got to act different. Um, and so from 1870 to 1880, again, another census record, we see a major shift in what the Chinese men are doing in the Delta. In 1870, when they're on that, um, the census record, they're listed as laborers. They're working in the field. By 1880, they are listed as merchants. Merchants is a big word for the story of Chinese in America, Chinese in Mississippi. I'm gonna stop right here because I missed a step. Please turn on the uh, uh, slideshow, if you don't mind. I made you some, video, some uh, visuals just in case you do wanna tune me out or you're interested in the type of people and the type of culture that um, we're holding in the archives. Thanks, forgot that. I went off script, sorry. Um, <laughs> So, 
I'm also going to take a sip of water. Anybody else thirsty? Okay, so you, we've seen, we have evidence that the Chinese men, men, have moved from being laborers to merchants. Now I'm going to bring this down to a very specific case. This is what's happening in Greenville and in Cleveland, Mississippi. These are two stories that I'm following from the oral histories that we were given in the 90s. Um, what we know is from those original sojourners, those men who came to farm, to labor, they pooled their resources. Now again, remember, they had financial resources. They were intent on making more to send back home. So they would pool their resources, and in Cleveland specifically, there was the Joe Brothers family. The Joe Brother family was a broad name for a bunch of people, a bunch of different fam families. So when we talk about the Joe Brothers in Cleveland, the early days, the 1800s, the, the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, we could be talking also about the Chu family, the Lu's, the Ling's, it was just, at that time, they were all known as Joes. There's a reason for that. In 1882, our government decided that perhaps we had too many Chinese men in the United States. And after a series of laws and a series of um, attempts to alleviate the Chinese population in America, our government created the 1882 exclusion laws. Anybody ever familiar, heard of those? Familiar with those? Great. Okay. This was the first time our American government forbade a specific group of people from coming to America. And it was for the Chinese. To be creative, the way that you could come to America from China was if you were a merchant. That's it. You could come as a student, you could come as a teacher, you could come as a guest, but you all had to leave. Merchants could stay. 1882 is the exclusion law. 1880 in the census in Mississippi, our Chinese men have declared themselves as what? Merchants. Two years before the 1882 exclusion law demanded that the only way you could stay is as merchants. See anybody else's mind blown just a little bit? Um, so when I am entertaining guests in the building, uh, lately we have been welcoming uh, folks from all over the world and all over the nation uh, through the Viking tour group voyages. Um, the one question I get a lot is, how did Chinese end up in Mississippi? How did they get there and why? And I mean, it usually is pretty much that, you know, oh my gosh, what happened there? Um, I even have evidence, because as an archivist, I love evidence. Um, and I hope I don't blind y'all. It's got a glass on it. But um, can you see this at all? The little man up here. This is Edwin Chu. And um, he and his brother brought their dad to the archives. 2014, to ask that very question, how did Chinese get here and what did they do here and why did they stay? Because they had discovered that their great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather had lived and died in Mississippi, and they had never known it. So, small plug, Far East, Deep South. Far East, Deep South. Highly recommend that you watch that on, online. It's all about finding your roots in the Mississippi Delta. And you might recognize someone in the film. Um, <laughs> so if you want to know how did, or why did Chinese end up in Mississippi, what happened there, and how, that, how it all happened, I pretty much just told you. They were recruited. Everybody finished? I'm kidding. It's only 1221. I have a feeling you want to know a little bit more. Um, now that you know how they got there, the first group came over as laborers. 
occasionally they would go back to their home village. They would spread the word that uh, being uh, merchants in the Mississippi Delta was profitable. Hey, why don't you come over with me? We can all make money together. And by the way, while you're in America, um, if you want to go home and take your little sum of money, that's fine. We'll just keep the store running and transfer in some other neighbors and other friends. That was all working great until the 1882 exclusion laws. And 1882 exclusion laws uh, introduced an interesting situation. Again, you have to be a merchant. So one of the ways that the Chinese reacted to the 1882 exclusion laws while still seeking to improve their lives, which was ultimately what they wanted to do the very first time, um, they would kind of um, share their identity, maybe. Uh, it's a thing called paper sons and daughters. Anybody familiar with that term, paper sons and daughters? Okay. So it sounds very smart, but it got difficult. Um, from 1882 until 1946-ish, the, these laws forbade Chinese men from coming to America. That's a long time, right? And yet our population in the Delta continues to grow. How did that happen? Well, paper sons and daughters was the, situa was the solution for the Delta Chinese. I'm not throwing shade on anybody else. And it's not real shade anyway. But um, many of the men who were already merchants, established merchants in the Delta, would share their identity with neighbors, relatives, maybe, you know, just random friends, um, in order for that person to claim relationship to the merchant who was already in America. You following me? So you got one merchant, and that one merchant may have paper sons or daughters on paper that are not anywhere biologically related to him, but on paper they are so that they can come to America. That means that this person who is um, claiming uh, relationship to the merchant in America, he's giving up every bit of his identity and relationship to an ancestry to come to America, and then to stay, and then to hopefully become as successful as the primary merchant so that he can then share his name on paper to other friends and family and bring them over. So from this one merchant, you can see this, de this web develop of paper sons and daughters, which means in the Delta, at one time, we might have had a lot of folks who were not who they say they were, but we love them. Um, the federal government caught on to this. They caught on to this because they, were, they, they pondered the same question. We are not allowing Chinese men into, the, into America, but somehow they keep coming, and the population is growing. What do we do? So, everybody heard of Ellis Island? Yeah? Mm-hmm. Angel Island. Who knows Angel? Mm-hmm. Angel Island is for the Chinese what Ellis Island is for every other immigrant. Angel Island is in California. That is where, after 1870, those original 400 Chinese men who came to the Delta, they came through New Orleans, that was the one and only time that the Chinese, in flux, in a large group, came to the Delta. After that, everybody came through Angel Island over in California. They did not work on the railroad. I bet I just answered a lot of questions with that one. Okay. Um, <laughs> they did not work on the railroad. They had some family, but, you know, they didn't do it. Um, anyway, so Angel Island is this place where our immigrants are coming in and they're having to answer questions. Because, you know, you say you're somebody, but like in 1920, how do you really trust it? Um, you got a government that thinks maybe some shady business is going on. So let's, ooh, let's develop a questionnaire. We're very good at that. So at Angel Island, if you were coming through and wanted to become 
uh, a merchant in America, basically a citizen, um, you had to answer a couple questions. Okay, okay, it was 200 or more. And it was questions like, do you remember the house across the little way in your home village if it had pots of flowers or pigs in the front? Okay, uh, how are you related to some distant relative that on paper you should know as your uncle? Sometimes I have to ask my mom how I'm related to some people. It was, it was a really difficult questionnaire and it was meant to try to weed out what they saw coming. Um, and this hits personal because again, when we go back to the oral histories, when we go back to the stories that were shared that we can fact check and we figure out, was this just a myth or did this really happen? Um, one of my best friends is a paper doctor. Her father, when he was 14, assumed the name of someone who was already in America, a merchant who was already here. He gave up everything. Uh, at 14 years old, did not speak the language. He traveled across on a boat to uh, Angel Island. He was detained for three months. Who in here has a 14-year-old or has experienced being a 14-year-old who can sit still for three months without losing it? Yeah. Um, he did. And this was all um, about 1923, 1924. Um, and he eventually comes through Angel Island, they allow him through, and he's coming to Chicago to meet his brother, his biological brother. On paper, they're brothers, and biologically, they're brothers, but it's not the same names. So they're in, they're in Chicago for a little while. George is growing up. He's about 20. He and his older brother, who we only ever really know as Big Uncle, um, they have amassed enough money and there's an opportunity to float down the Mississippi River, stop off at the port of Greenville, and there's a storefront. There is a Chinese grocery store that is owned and the grocer is wanting to leave and go back to China. Do these brothers want to set up shop here and, prove and see what their future could be? And they jump at it. And from that point forward, George and his brother opened Minsang grocery store in Greenville. And four years ago, Ninsang closed. It, um, George and his brother, again, because he was just called Big Uncle, um, George did go back to uh, China because his mother had wired and said, I have discovered a wife for you. So he went home and married her, and it was a beautiful marriage. Um, they had five children, all under the paper name because it was important for George as a child and for his family to send him to America to become an American because it was going to be important for the lineage to carry on. And they bargained with their ancestry. Um, in 1946, George had been a veteran. He was a veteran. He had served in the war. Um, he and his wife prayed over it, um, and they decided that they would take the opportunity that, again, the federal government, knowing that perhaps they may have created a situation that maybe some false information was out there, they said, if you come and tell us everything about yourselves, all your relatives, all, how long you've been here, all the different places in, the, in, in America that you have lived, and we see that you have given back to your community, that you are a good business person who has contributed to the economic base within your community, we'll consider giving you your ancestral name. And it was a big bargain. But he did. George did this. And... He and his wife both met in Memphis with the federal agent. They presented their information, and they were allowed to reclaim their name. Then George had to turn around and tell his children, who were stair-step in age. They were in school, um, elementary, 
schools uh, in kindergarten. Um, by the way, I know you have mastered the last name Pang. It is great. I'm so proud of you. But uh, now your last name is Sue. So <laughs> we're going to go with that one now. And so he had to tell his children that they are Sue's from now on. And it was just a little moment in those little people's lives. But I saw the reality of the hugeness of that across my friend's face about a year and a half ago when she stood in the museum that we now have because of her and the donations that she's made, um, she and her husband. Um, and she told that story standing with her father's portrait behind her, telling that to her son and her grandchildren for the very first time for them to hear that. And it was huge. You could see that this massive decision just to assume a name, to get a better opportunity, to build a foundation in America so that the next generation, who they may never know, will have an opportunity to do something bigger and better. Um, that all happened like that across Frida's face. Does anybody in here know Frida Kwan? Frida Sue Kwan? You should Google Frida Sue Kwan. <laughs> um, she's marvelous. She's been recorded several times. She's owned a couple of different documentaries. Um, but Frida has been the most giving and open uh, donor in the museum because she allows me, and now you, to know this very intimate element of her history and her thread um, that has is a part of the Mississippi Delta's Chinese story. They're not all that nuanced and, and knotted and, and complex, but they all have that element of, I will do what it takes, with good reason, as long as I can make a solid step for my children. And what Frida's dad and ultimately her mom did was they made a solid home for her and her brother and sisters in Greenville so that they had home in America, so that they could then challenge themselves in education. Next, take on the, the um, uh, task of being intelligent to compete in American society. And then what Frida and her husband have done with that, with their intelligence, is found a solid foundation for their children to now go to schools, um, to have gone to schools, that perhaps Chinese, when Frida and her husband were younger, would not have been so open to them attending. To the point where Frida's granddaughter, when this all was happening, Frida's granddaughter was the editor of the newspaper at Ole Miss two years ago. So Frida's granddaughter, Frida, whose father was not even allowed to legally come into the United States anyway, and we didn't even want him, according to the act, her granddaughter was the loudest voice at Ole Miss for a year. She had that megaphone. And it was just, it was amazing to see. And it's amazing that that is a legacy of so many of the Delta Chinese. Um, I might be getting a little emotional about this, but it's 12.35 and I want to leave you time to talk, to ask me questions. Um, Frida's story is special and unique, but that's because I know it. A lot of these stories, a lot of the Chinese challenges and um, their individual experiences growing up as Chinese in the Delta, um, we don't know yet. So if there is anybody out there looking for a thesis or a PhD project or your next book, highly recommend it. Come on over, I'll show you what I got. Um, I did that once to a little gal named Adrienne Berard and I ended up uh, housing her, letting her live with me for a year and she wrote a book. It's called Water Tossing Boulders and it's about the uh, Gong Lum v. Rice case that came out of Rosedale, Mississippi. Um, so yeah. I may not be able to let you live with me anymore because I live with my mother, but <laughs> staying with her for now. Um, but 
we have all these opportunities to dig deeper into the history that is at Delta State and at the archive and in the museum. Um, so please check us out. And uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. We have time for questions. If you have a question, you can raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you. Emily will answer anything you got. Emily, yes, you helped me a great deal on previous times on other things. So hello, and this is wonderful talk. Yes, sir. Let me ask you about something. Yes, sir. Um, you're in Cleveland. So seven or eight miles up the road from you uh, is Marigold. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And you've been to Marigold. When you cross into town, what there is of the town, <laughs> there's a big sign still there, at least it was the last time I was there, five or six years ago, a store that is no longer a store, but it's a big building. Mm -hmm. Across the pediment, there is the, the, follow, the following words, the gong company. Yes, sir. Say a word about the gong company. Um, well, the gong store, gong company in Marigold is almost an icon stop. Uh, the gong family was a big, uh, a big part of the life in Marigold. It was one of three Chinese grocery stores at one time, one of two that most people rec remember. Um, and in a small town like Marigold, which I think is a one square mile big, that's as big as the town is, um, why would you need two Chinese grocery stores? Well, I'll tell you, it's because when the Chinese grocery stores were establishing themselves, they were within walking distance of their customers. And the customers would two or three times a day come to the market because maybe they didn't have a refrigerator just yet. And as Fre my friend Frida does talk about, she said her store, her family store, was known as the uh, refrigerator of the neighborhood. They saw their neighbors two or three or four times a day. Um, but the gong store is marvelous. Um, when the gong family closed up, they closed up and left everything on the shelves. And that did mean after a couple of years, some canned goods exploded. Um, but a couple of, um, maybe, let's see, eight or nine years ago, they opened up the store. They were ready to sell the property, um, do something with the property, and I got to go in. It did not smell as bad as you might think. But um, also at the same time, a photographer came uh, from New York I know, New York. Mm. But no, he was great. Um, his name is Christian Patterson, and he now holds the best visual representation of the Gong Store because as things happen, time goes on, things change, the Gong Store no longer looks like the Gong Store. It's great. It's a restaurant now, and the side of the building that you would recognize so well now, it, um, it had the... Wonder Bread uh, advertisement that had been hand painted on the side of the wall and you know the big gong store down the side of it. Uh, that's gone. It's got a great big black rectangle and a Star Wars quote. But hey, things change, right? But Christian Patterson has a great um, collection of the history of the gong store, physically, uh, visually. Good to see. The Wing family from Marx had a store. Yes. Mrs. Wing was second generation Chinese from Chicago, mm -hmm. and Mr. Wing was from China. They had five children, all of whom went to school in Mississippi, to university, Mississippi State, Mississippi College. Of those five children, only one stayed in Mississippi. As you're looking at the second and third generations, what do you see uh, as to those children migrating out of Mississippi? 
what do I see that why they have left or what has happened to them? Yes, um, again, that story arc um, ending in 1970 is when you see the families and the, and the uh, communities really beginning to shrink. And it's because by that time, you know, you've had that solid foundation of we are within the community and respected. Please take every educational opportunity to do what's next best for you. And as all Americans about that time, we were engaging in, um, or had been engaging in um, uh, the space race and technology was booming and a lot of these children were graduating with uh, degrees in engineering and um, mathematics, all kinds of creative technology STEM related and as much as I love the Delta, we are agriculture. And so they didn't really have that space to develop professionally and so they had to do what their great-grandparents had done and leave what they knew and go find their next adventure, the next place to land. So we see the, gen the generations of the Chinese about the 1960s and 70s doing that massive relocation. Does that answer? Yes. My recollection is that there was, in the early days, the Chinese were ruled as colored in the state where there were only two things, whites and coloreds. Yes, sir. But that at some point, somewhere around 1950, I think it was, they were changed over and became white. Uh, and can you comment on that? I, I'm not sure about reclassifying them as white, but offering, um, having an opportunity to declare themselves as non-African American and non-white. There was the opportunity to say, because our Constitution said there were only two kinds of people at one time, when it was revised, it allowed for people of a different ethnic heritage to be recognized as citizens as well, not having to choose just one or two. Uh, I can comment on that. Oh, good. Uh, well, I started school in, uh, well, I was born in 42, so started in 48, and uh, there were Chinese in, in school with me uh, then, but later uh, a cousin of mine told me that she was on the Greenville School Board at the time that decision was made and it was brought before the school board the question of whether the uh, Chinese should be considered white or, or black. Uh, sadly, that's, that's the way it went. Mm -hmm. And uh, my cousin said that they did vote for them to be uh, classed as white, but she told them, she said, I'm all for it, but be aware that they are going to probably be uh, the first and second in their class and so forth. <laughs> and that was the case when I graduated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, the first and third in mm -hmm. the class were, were Chinese people. Uh, uh, the one who was third was a good friend of mine. No. <laughs> and that did happen. It was almost town by town. Like Cleveland for a while had a Chinese mission school where children boarded there from 1937 to 1946. Greenville had a one-room schoolhouse that was just for, um, I mean, even the title on the bottom of the picture says Oriental children. Um, for out in Moorhead, uh, some families had requested a uh, tutor who would come and teach their children. So it was almost deciding whether a child, a Chinese child was black or white um, to go to the public schools was honest a, st a town by town debate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the railroad Chinese mm -hmm. that helped build the transcontinental railroads and ended up in uh, San Francisco and California. Mm -hmm. Is there a connection between those and you know eventually coming in at Angel Island and the Mississippi Chinese? I know of one familial relationship to the transcontinental, and he's my board president, Gilroy Chow. 
<laughs> we have some questions from the live stream. Let me uh -oh. ask one of those. Our friend Avery Rollins says, I was an FBI agent who covered the Delta from Greenville to Greenwood to Clarksdale from 1978 to 1984. I met and worked with hundreds of police officers and sheriff's deputies during that time. I did not meet a single Chinese American in law enforcement during that time. Why? 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 <laughs> I told you he was in the FBI. He gets right to the point. Right. Uh, I think he'd know better than I. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, no. Uh, I will ask from now on, um, but it seemed like the professions were simply to be in the market. Um, that was where the first generation to the Delta settled, and it passed to a second generation Chinese uh, family. And then that after that third and fourth, that's when they begin to get work into the STEM professions or become teachers or uh, I don't. Yeah, I, I really don't know. I it it, it is uh, very, very curious um, for 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 me as I think about uh, the um, the the efforts to make sure that that the black businesses. Um, not be successful um, because whenever uh, the uh, uh, black, black uh, groups of people uh, had um, su su successful uh, businesses, they were burned down or um, sabotaged in some way. So to uh, allow uh, the Chinese to come in as merchants it is is very interesting and and I was reading your um poster over here which are very nice but uh, i I'm very uh, sensitive to the term melting pot because uh that that the, is a farce. Um, if, if when we we watch the slideshows, the 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 Chinese um, are pretty much to themselves, and um, the the uh, theory behind the melting pot was that everybody was going to come in and and uh, just sort sort of. Um, assimilate into um, whatever the the quote American culture um, is and, um, and, and and you can go go to any big city and and see that there is generally a Chinatown so um, there, there, I, I, you can see there, there are lots of questions that, that come up in my mind uh, that, that it, it just, just kind of, of uh, it, it, hypocritical of, of uh, the, the, this country, the, the, the way things, the, the um, politics in, in, in the, this country and how, how, how they treat different people. Yes, ma'am. And I, w I will agree, melting pot is a broad word that if I were smarter, I probably would have chosen a better vocabulary. Um, and I will say that here in the grocery stories uh, exhibit that can go out to anybody who would like to borrow it, um, we are only talking about what's happening in the Mississippi Delta, um, just under the lens of the Delta from 1870 to 1970, dealing with that. Um, and I should probably make that more clear. You mentioned Adrian Bernard. Yes. And I read that book. Thank you for being 
in some way instrumental in her work. Specifically, I recommend that book, Gong versus Wright, Supreme Court decision issued in 1927, the year of the big flood. Mm -hmm. They had something else to do in the Delta besides Wade Water. Chinese, that suit came about because a student who had been going to the white school, mm -hmm. because they considered themselves white, was suddenly challenged she wasn't white. And so if she wasn't white, then she had to be colored. And her mother was incensed. She did not want her to be colored because colored people were powerless. Mm -hmm. The Mississippi, well, the local Bolivar County judge said she wasn't white. She had to be black. They took it to the Mississippi Supreme Court, which reversed Bolivar County. They took it to the U.S. Supreme Court, which sided with the local court against the U.S. Constitution, 14th Amendment. This is all about black or white. Yeah. And Chinese and Lebanese and Italian and whoever else showed up in Mississippi definitely did not want to be black. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Vicksburg. Everybody knows that. I'm very proud of that. I grew up on Lanes Hill. At the bottom of the hill, there was a Lebanese store, Mr. Abraham, and there was a Chinese store. I don't know their names. They lived in our neighborhoods, mm -hmm. but they never socialized with us with us. In Vicksburg, they went to the white school. It's complicated. It is. Extremely. It's kind of interesting that uh, my question or my comment kind of dovetails into that, um, seeing as how we haven't seen each other in years. Um, growing up in the Delta, like you, it was just something that we understood. We understood the, the cultural side of it. And that's kind of what I wanted to, to let you bring out a little bit is how did the Chinese that came in maintain their culture and how do you feel like they helped to uh, weave that into the culture of the Delta? Because like you said, if you grew up in the Delta or you've been in the Delta or lived in the Delta, it is a totally different world from the rest of Mississippi, from the rest of the world, um, because it does have so many different layers to it. So how do you feel like, or what have you seen of how they, um, how they maintained their culture, but assimilated or worked into some of those other cultures? Um, some were hard and fast, absolutely staying within the Chinese community, and then some things were up for debate. Again, it was, the, it was the balancing of what do you want right now and what do you want for a future. Um, you could have stayed in China, in your village, with your, uh, your community, and retained every bit of your ancestry and been just fine. It would have probably been hard, but moving to America in the same instance had its hardness and its challenges. Um, but what you were doing at that point was you were making a sacrifice, not for yourself, but for hopefully a future, uh, the next person who, the next generation after you. Um, the cultures, maintaining, maintaining a true Chinese culture for the Delta Chinese who are here now is like asking me as a French descendant to be French or to be loyal to France. It's hard because I've been raised and I've been taught that I'm an American. Um, I'm proud that I have French heritage, just a little bit. I can sing the French national anthem. It doesn't bring me to tears. But, you know, um, I think that's where, if we all look at that within ourselves of like, what are you asking me to be? How are you, what are you asking me to negotiate within my heritage to say that I'm an American? You can see where the bargain and the um, arrangement happened family by family, town by town. Um, does that answer? Okay. 
early in the talk, you referred to the Joe family and how many members there were. Yes. Uh, was that due to the paper sons and daughters? Okay. okay. And probably a little bit of miscommunication when you signed, when you were being registered coming to port. Americans hearing one word and that's not the word you said if you were Chinese. Yeah. You know, that's how middle names became last names and last names became first names. We did a job on that. Our friend Bill Justice um, asks from the live stream uh, about the documentary Far East, Deep South. He recommends it and he says, for those that haven't seen it, the documentary is about a California family who discovered their Delta connection. Then he asks, was Baldwin Chu's experience of rediscovering that Delta family unusual? Do you see a number of people making a similar family discovery? That was a one in a million, I would say. Um, how far do you want me to go into that one? Into answering that one? Yeah, more than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, in 1920s, okay, now I'm lying. Somewhere in the 1920s, um, Casey Liu and his son, Charles, um, come to America. They come to run a grocery store because they want to eventually be able to pay for um, their, uh, their or, this is going to get complicated. Have y'all ever done genealogy? Okay. So it doesn't glare. This guy and his brother have a dad. Their dad was one year old the last time he saw his dad in China because his dad, Charles, and granddad, KC. This is why you bring your mom. <laughs> yes. Casey and Charles are the, now I'm messed up. Okay, so Baldwin and Edwin's father, Charles, last sees his father, Casey and Charles Liu, in China when he's a year old. They come to America, they open a grocery store, they die, unfortunately. But they had to leave a lot of their material back in Pace, Mississippi. Fast forward to 2014, 2011, 2014, those years, and we're opening a Chinese Heritage Museum. People are bringing artifacts back. A family named the Duns bring back lots of boxes because they had started their grocery store in Pace, the very store that Baldwin and Edwin's great-grandfather had started. Their, their great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather's materials are still in that box that has now come back to the archives. I'm looking through the box. I see a Bible with Casey Lou's name in it. They bring their dad about three months later after I find that Bible, and it clicks. They're looking for Casey Lou because that's Charles's dad. That doesn't happen very often in the world when you're looking for facts. But if you're confused at this point, watch Far East Deep South. It'll be easy then. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. It's back into the homesteading situation has anything to do with what we're talking about today. Okay. You know what homesteading means? Yes, and nobody owned the property. Nobody lived there. People moved in and... No, not a part of this. Sorry. No, no. That's just way too early. Yeah. It could be. Not a thing I know. Um, how often did they travel back and forth when they first came to America from here to China? As often as they want. Um, the... Wing family in Marx, uh, all the girls went back to school in China for a little while, um, even though they could have gone to school in America, but they got a better education by going back to China. Uh, 
George went back at least four times. Um, it was, once you're here, you're here. You did run the risk of potentially not being allowed back in, but you were already a citizen, so you should be allowed. Emily, would you say a few words about the um, pop-up banners that you have in the material over by the, on the oh. stand there? So Grocery Stories is a traveling exhibit. These, um, we've taken stories and married them with the photographs that are the subject of the stories, and it's basically the lives lived behind the grocery store counters. And these are five, uh, three banners of a full six banner um, exhibit that can travel anywhere. You just give me a call and say, hey, I want it here. Um, and I bring it to you if I can drive that far. Um, and you can stay at your spot um, for six weeks or so. It's free. Um, and then we are in the Lunar New Year. And as the Chinese and the Delta say it, Gong Hei Fa Choi. I know. Nobody here knows that part. Yeah. Don't worry. It's okay. I get laughed at a lot. But, um, and, and so do all of my Chinese friends in the Delta. <laughs> because we speak the wrong, the old kind. And there are little activity books that are over on the table to help you celebrate uh, the Lunar New Year, as well as museum brochures if you want to figure out how to find me uh, physically at the archives. And if folks are particularly interested, you have something else that you can give them a list of the grocery? Right. Um, one, of my de one of my board members, um, in his retirement, decided to make an entire list of all the grocery stores that had ever existed in, Chinese grocery stores that existed in Greenville. So thank you very much, Raymond Seed. And I have a few, I don't have a whole lot, um, but I have a few if you want to look or if you would like to have one. You can thank you all for being here with us today. Um, don't forget about the genealogy workshop next month. I hope that we see you next week when we'll be back in the Delta talking about hot tamales with Ann Martin. We have copies of Ethnic Heritage in Mississippi, which contains Emily's fine um, essay on the Delta Chinese. She'll be glad to answer any further questions you may have about that. Uh, over here, you can buy a copy, and she'll be glad to sign it. Thank you all for coming. Help me thank Emily for this fabulous program today. <laughs>